חברים וחברות, אני שמח וגם גאה להזמין לבמה את יאיר לפיד. Hello and good afternoon. First of all, Maurizio, this was great. I want to first of all thank Rabbi Julie Schoenfeld for all this incredible work she's doing and to Rabbi Gila Draw for tolerating the fact that the unbearable fact that the State of Israel does not recognize her as a rabbi while her son is an intelligence officer in the army. I want to I thank Rabbi Jerry Shkolnik, the incoming president of the Rabbinical Assembly. It's good to know that you have male rabbis as well. <laughs> I want to I thank Mauricio again, who is the president of the Rabbinical Assembly in Israel, and to Mr. my friend Mr. Isa Hast, who is the executive director of the Masoti movement in Israel. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who do not know Isa, um, then you should know he lost so much weight this last year that it's like there's another Isa has who didn't make it to the convention. <laughs> As uh, Mauricio was saying, I, I came here in what is, for me, a terrible timing. <laughs> <laughs> the election in Israel that was planned for um, September the 4th were just canceled, Charles Mufaz and Kadima has joined the Netanyahu government as junior partners. And right now, what it seems to happen is that we are going to a campaign in order to unite all sane forces within the country. Not, not everything that happened in the last 24 hours is wrong, uh, because uh, Kadima has come back to be uh, what it actually always has been, which is part of the Likud. They came back home, and um, I'm going to use this opportunity to congratulate them for this reunification. It also says... <laughs> it also says that the political map has changed, and we, we are now the only, or the sole, central party. Uh, we have uh, Labour, Avodai and Meretz on the left. We have the Likud that includes now Kadima on the right. And we became the sole representatives of the majority of the uh, people of Israel that belongs to the same middle class. And, and I intend and determined not to disappoint them because they were let down by too many people in too many occasions and always for the wrong reasons, and somebody has to keep their interests going. And, and I really intend to be that somebody. <laughs> what it also says is that since last night, I am swamped with phone calls from advisors and strategists and campaign managers who are all saying the same thing. Are you nuts? What are you doing in Atlanta? <laughs> And I told them, I understand your panic, <laughs> but I need to be here. I need to be here because I believe in prioritizing. I believe in the distinction between what is less important and what is really important. And this is really important. This is really important because I believe the Jewish identity is in danger. And you are the gatekeepers. You are part of the last line of defense of people who still believe that Judaism shouldn't be the jailhouse of ideas, but the liberator of ideas. <laughs> Judaism, Judaism should not be the disintegrator of people, but what uh, get people together. And Judaism shouldn't be subordinated to small politics 
because it answers a higher rule. And I know that you feel very often that the State of Israel doesn't even seem to understand or appreciate the fact that you have saved the Jewish people from assimilation and from submersion. So if I have a chance to come here and thank you for keeping our mutual identity alive, then I really, I'm really happy to do so. There is a story. It's, it's my family story. It's my story. It's my founding story. And although it happened more than 20 years before I was born, in February 1945. No, it's less than 24 years before. We in February 1945. In February 1945, my father was a 13-year-old kid, child, and he was living with my grandma in a small basement in the Budapest ghetto. And at that stage, they were living mostly of the meat of horses, dead horses they found on the street. And the Russians were already approaching Budapest, so the Germans, along with the Hungarian fascists, start taking out the Jews in death convoys. And most of them were led into the Danube rivers, river, in which they were ordered to dig holes into the ice, and then they were shot into the freezing water. And one very early mon Monday morning, the Germans had surrounded my father's block, and they start taking him in a death, one of those death convoys that had approximately 600 people. And people were looking at them from high windows, knowing all so well that they were sentenced to death. And they were just walking, but at a certain point, a Russian plane lowered over this convoy. And for a minute there, there was a tremble, and people were yelling and shouting, and the Germans were sh shooting the Schmeisser machine guns into the sky. And my father, hid behind a small public lavatory painted in green. And his mother that stood behind him pushed him inside this little lavatory and said, do you pee? You have to pee now. And it's hard. It's hard to pee when you're 13 and you're scared and you're cold and people are shooting and they all want to kill you. But he did. He peed. And she closed the door behind them. And the convoy left without them. And 15 minutes later, from the 600 people in this convoy, 598 were dead under the ice in the Danube River. And my father and my grandmother were standing alone in the street and they were free. They could go anywhere. Here in the United States, while flying in here, you see hundreds and thousands of miles that no man ever walks in. And, and once I flew from, from Sydney to Perth in Australia. And for five and a half hours, I saw just land that no man ever set foot in. And Paris was already liberated, and of course London was free, but my father, a 13-year-old child, had no place to go to. He had no place to go to. So they went back to the ghetto. They went back to the ghetto, to the same basement, hoping only that the Russians will arrive before the next death convoy will take place. Many years later, in 1986, I went with my father to Budapest. And we were just, you know, strolling together in the street, looking at it, and he, it was the first time in 40 years that he's been to Budapest. Most of the time he ate. And we were just walking down the street, and suddenly he stood up and, and, he, and he started crying. My father was a big, fat man, and, and it was weird to watch him crying. He becomes all reddish, and he's crying, and he says, Yeah, here, yeah, yeah, look, look, look. And I'm looking, and there's nothing there. There's nothing to look at. There's only one empty street with a very small public lavatory painted in green that is still there. And when he relaxed a bit, he said to me, You know, this is it. This is the place I realized I always have to have a place to go to. I cannot live without having a place to go to. And we were standing there, two grown men stroking the green wall of this little public lavatory. 
and the Hungarians on the street skirted us carefully because they thought we were nuts. <laughs> but we were not nuts. We were a statistical error. He, he was supposed to be dead and I was supposed not to be born and yet we were there against all odds. It took me many years to realize that I'm like my father. When I grew up I thought like every other kid in the Western world that I'm more like you, like the Americans. I mean his, his river was the Danube, my river was the Bruce Springsteen album that carries this name. And his basic trauma was the Holocaust and my basic trauma was wars in which Jews are shooting back and eventually win. And he lost his father and I had him and he irritated me most of the time. And the synagogue he didn't go to was now logical, which is the Hungarian version of the conservative movement. And the synagogue I'm not going to is an Israeli synagogue and we didn't build it yet. And he lost his God in the ghetto and who could blame him? And I found mine in the Lebanon war, not far away from Beirut. And his first language was Hungarian and I dedicated my whole life, my entire life to Hebrew. But as the year goes by, I, I realize more and more that there is something that connects us, that is stronger than all ornaments. And this is this eerie, unexplainable thing called the Jewish faith. This is our big secret. This is the thing that makes me stand here and you sit here. Because the split between us, the division between us is just an historical accident. If we are to move the biographies of our fathers and grandfathers half inch to the right or to the left, I could be you and you could be me. I could be you and you could be me because somewhere down the line of the family history of each and every person who sits in this room, there is a man standing on a pier in a harbor trying to figure out which direction is he going? We are part of something. People all over the world spend a lifetime trying to be part of something. They join cults, they become politically active, they hook up with street bang gangs, they wear blue bandanas and they're killing other people just because they wear red bandanas. They, they go to India and they worship gurus. They're going to a church, they're going to a country club, they're going to a football game, they're going for 30 years to the same bar only because the bartender remembers their name. We have all that as a birthright. And we should cherish this right because it sounds like a contradiction in terms, but being committed is a privilege. I could be you and you could be me, so if somebody is raising his hand on a Jew in Atlanta, it is happening to me. If gravestones are desecrated in a cemetery in the Ukraine, it is happening to me. If Muslims are stabbing a rabbi in the streets of Paris, it is happening to me. And I came here because I believe that if something is happening in Israel, it is happening to you. I'm an Israeli politician. And when Israeli politicians are coming to the United States, they're always making the mistake in trying to explain the American friends the troubles and complexities of Israeli politics and how hard it is to do the right thing no matter how much they want to. So I'm going to make it simple. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure the rotten bill will disappear. I do not know whether it's good politics or bad politics. I do not know what my constituency thinks about it. We never polled it and I'm not going to spend a nickel in polling it. Because no matter what the results would be, my mind will not change. This is just wrong. And therefore, it has to disappear.
I'm going to do whatever is necessary and whatever is in my power to make it feasible to women, conservative or reform, to pray in the Wailing Wall wearing their praying shawls. Why? Because Israel cannot be the only country in the Western world that has no freedom of religion to Jews. This is just wrong. And therefore it has to disappear. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure there are going to be civil marriages in Israel. The, to <laughs> the total dominance of the Israeli Rabbanut over marriage and divorce in Israel is an insult to every free man. This is just wrong and therefore it has to disappear. <laughs> and I'm going to do everything in my power to ensure the equality of all movements of Judaism in Israel, <laughs> Orthodox, Conservative or Reform. In conversion, in budgets, in the eyes of the law. No one no one can claim ownership over the Jewish God. Small, petty politics cannot determine something that is eternal as the Jewish identity. This is just wrong. And therefore, it has to disappear. And I'm not even doing this for you. I'm doing this because I could be you, and you could be me. For many years, the tragedy of the conservative movement uh, in the United States and Israel was the fact that the most majority of Israelis are actually conservative, they just don't know it. <laughs> because the majority of Israelis wanted a pluralistic, sane, welcoming Judaism. They were just not aware to the fact that there is such a thing. In the past few years, it is changing the current uh, leadership of the movement in Israel has changed the situation in many ways. The number of congregations went up in 50% within the last five years. The youth movement is flourishing, you know that better than I do. And the new generation of politicians is not afraid to say, I could be you and you could be me. I could be you and you could be me because we sprout from the same root. Many years ago, on 19th century England, an Irish MP yelled at the parliament, at Benjamin Disraeli, Queen Victoria's Jewish Prime Minister, you bloody Jew. And Disraeli's response was when the forefathers of the honorable member from Dublin were running naked and cruel in the forests, my forefathers were priests in King Solomon's palace. Thank you very much for having me tonight. <laughs>